हेलो एवरी वन माई नेम इज़ डॉक्टर मयूर अग्रवाल वेलकम टू अनादर सेशन दिस इज नीट एस एस एंडोक्राइनोलॉजी रिकॉल दिस इज नॉट द एग्जैक्ट क्वेश्चन विच वॉज आस दिस क्वेश्चन आर बेस्ड ऑन वॉट वॉज आस दिस विल हेल्प यू टू नो दैट हाउ द क्वेश्चन आर फ्रेम वॉट आर द वॉट इज दैट द एग्जामिनर वॉन्ट्स टू आस यू वॉट इज दैट वन वर्ड इन द क्वेश्चन दैट चेंजेस द आंसर सो दिस विल गिव यू एन एच फॉर अपकमिंग एग्जाम्स Okay, so let's start with our first question here. The first question is, the type of inheritance in FHH is whether homozygous activating, inactivating, heterozygous activating, or inactivating. Okay, so maybe you may not get very right at because you have very less time. If you know the basic, then you don't have need to cram all this. So first, what is the question? See FHH that is familial. hypocalciuric hypercalcemia here the calcium in the blood is high and in urine it's low okay the basic pathology here is casr mutation what does this csr do this is calcium sensing receptor it senses the calcium or better ionic calcium okay it senses the ionic calcium if the calcium is high this csr will decrease the pth if it is low it would increase the pth right so if there is inactivating mutation that means this csr is not working this ionic calcium won't be sensed and ph pth would be released more okay so this is what is the basic defect here so definitely we have an inactivating mutation here and this is an heterozygous inactivating mutation this is the correct answer this condition is autosomal dominant few more mcq i'll discuss here which were asked in various examination regarding fhh so this is autosomal dominant as there is less of calcium in urine the ratio is what we check for differentiating uh, it versus phpt right so the calcium excretion ratio is less than 0.01 this has been asked multiple times in various exam and this is a pth dependent hypercalcemia we know that this calcium sensing receptor is not functioning that is why the pth is raised which is leading to raise in ionic or total both calcium are raised so this is a pth dependent hypercalcemia this has been asked various time pth dependent other causes of pth dependent we know phpt obviously and lithium induced hypercalcemia so all these are pth dependent hypercalcemia then other than csr mutation what other things can lead to this fhh this is not given in williams or harrison so there are three types of fhh first one we have seen that is inactivating mutation of csr other than that we have alpha sub unit of g11 so this is downstream pathway of csr if this is defective again this csr won't function and pth would be released more even though there is calcium right other than this there is adapter protein ap2s1 so this mutation what this causes this decreases the sensitivity of this csr for calcium so these all mutation will lead to fhh uh one more question i will tell you here what would be the homozygous inactivating mutation of csr so this will lead to neonatal severe hyperparathyroidism neonatal severe hyperparathyroidism this is caused by homozygous inactivating mutation of csr whereas fhh is due to heterozygous inactivating mutation of csr okay so this is the answer here next question which of the following snake bite causes pituitary apoplexy viper russell viper crate or cobra so this is very easy here we know that viper bite causes vasculotoxic injury and can lead to 
pituitary apoplexy but the uh, option here are both viper as well as russell viper the better option would better answer would be a russell viper than a viper if this was not given you may take viper i've gone through the uh, literature and uh, this there was uh, various case studies and cases published for this but we have few prospective study also even from india so a very good study was published in 2018 in neurology india from pgi chandigarh and what they have seen that this uh, hypo hypopituitarism in this can be acute or can be chronic can be symptomatic or can be asymptomatic when they did mri for these patient it can have empty cella something similar to shihan syndrome where you have hypoparathyroidism and that is due to apoplexy right or they can have normal imaging okay and in this series what they found that the most common hormonal defect was of growth hormone and di diabetes insipidus was not seen okay so this is the most common defect in this type of pituitary apoplexy and di was not seen in any of those patients okay next question which of the following drug is approved for type 1 diabetes other than insulin whether there is premlinotide liraglutide linagliptin or semaglutide okay so maybe some other options were there but we'll go with this the answer here is premlinotide we know that this is approved by fda in 2005 this is an amylin agonist okay so just few basic thing what is amylin this is islet amyloid polypeptide 37 amino acid it is co-secreted with insulin so obviously from the beta cell and this acts on area post trauma thereby leading to satiety decreasing glucagon decreasing hepatic glucose output decreasing gastric empty okay so this is important and premlinotide is this amylin agonist this has very short half life so it should be given before every meal this is approved both for type 1 as well as type 2 dm fda has approved this in 2005 and usually 30 to 60 microgram before each meal is given injectable subcutaneously usually we start with a lower dose 15 microgram other than that yes we have trials for liraglutide we have trials for semaglutide but they are not approved yet linagliptin i could not find a trial yes we have trial for lada but not for type 1 dm for linagliptin in gliptins i could find trials for vildagliptin and cetagliptin liraglutide uh, these we have trials and yes one more important question i'll discuss here dapagliflozin and sotagliflozin these are not fda approved but yes they are approved by the european agency and for type 1 dm i am talking about type 1 dm who have bmi more than 27 dapagliflozin is approved so this may be the next question if the premlinotide is not given in option i would go for this as a answer okay next question 28 year old pregnant female with 10 weeks of gestation with fasting blood sugar of 146 hbnc of 7.3 and no signs of insulin resistance and family history of diabetes is present what is your diagnosis 
प्री गेस्टेशनल टाइप टू डायबिटीज गेस्टेशनल डायबिटीज मॉडी टाइप वन डायबिटीज ओके सो मैनी ऑफ यू वुड हैव गेस्ट इट राइट without even thinking much about this question this is not that easy question because terminology varied from time to time from guideline to guideline what you are using so this is actually a confusing question if you are not very thorough with you may even get it correct without knowing much okay so the answer i would prefer here is pre gestational type 2 diabetes but yes you may argue that even modi can be correct yes i know that just let us talk about the basic first then we'll again come back to the question so what is this uh, gestational diabetes this term was coined around say 50 60 year back at the time the diagnosis wo, uh, the definition was that any hyperglycemia which is first diagnosed in pregnancy is gestational diabetes okay so any hyperglycemia first diagnosed in pregnancy this is what was the definition first definition but in 2010 iad psg has defined this as they an introduce another term that is overt diabetes if the cut off that is 126 and 200 which we take for diabetes if that is met the patient should be labeled as over diabetes and if uh, that is not and what we see for this gestational diabetes if that is there then you label as gestational diabetes that was uh, that all cut off came from hypo trial hyperglycemia and pregnancy outcome adverse pregnancy outcome in that they have taken a group of 24 to 32 week of gestation and that is how all those cut off were derived but this society what they did that they have taken the same cut off even for any trimester say at the beginning of pregnancy also every and who has almost adapted the same thing uh, nothing much difference but coming to ada ADA even when you will go through this year's guideline what they have told that for gestational diabetes they have taken the second and third trimester where you will define as gestational diabetes not in first trimester okay so second and third trimester is what is the ADA recommends for this using this uh, terminology gestational diabetes mellitus for the first trimester it would be pre gestational diabetes mellitus okay so here we have 10 weeks okay and fasting is above the over diabetes so the best option here would be an over diabetes or a pre gestational diabetes another terminology has also been introduced pregnancy complicating diabetes all those terms are used interchangeably but we have option here of pre gestational type 2 diabetes okay now coming that they have another part in this question they have given a positive family history as well as no signs of insulin resistance okay so these may be a part of type 2 or may not be and these they may be suggesting that you should go for modi but what happens in modi obviously we know that in glucokinase deficiency modi 2 this can be there we know that but usually what happen that fasting would be impaired and postprandial would be not that impaired usually in ogtt the difference is less than 50 that is how we suspect that but definitely the final diagnosis would be a genetic so my preference would be this answer but yes this depends on what the question says the exact wordings of the question and what options we have okay and again the treatment of modi is totally totally different it depends for this uh, 
glucokinase mutation this depends on from where the mutation is inherited and whether that baby is carrying that mutation or not that is an additional point I would like to add here. Say like if the mother is uh, this glucokinase deficient as well as the baby is deficient then if you are making that sugars normal then you are doing much harm because this baby has also that impaired thing right his insulin mechanism is also impaired right he also senses that uh, glucose level only at higher level he that baby releases insulin so by making this mother's glucose level normal you are doing harm say mother have this mutation and the baby does not have mutation then definitely we need to treat Okay, so that depends on whether that baby is carrying the same mutation or not and another totally different would be a baby having that mutation from the father and the mother do not have. So, that is totally different. So, that is like next level of question they will not ask so much things. Coming to our next question, question uh, we have here a 69 year old male patient with Graves disease on carbimazole and he now presents with redness of eyes and has a CS of 2 by 7 with the T4 of 14 microgram per DL. What is the next best step for this management? Do you want to continue with carbimazole? Do you want to give steroid followed by surgery? Give steroid followed by radioiodine or surgery? Okay. So, this many of you would have take that you should give steroid just by pointing out that these patient have redness of eye that is totally wrong. See there is something called CS that is clinical activity score and CVIT score these two are different thing this you will find in UGOGO guideline also this has been given in textbook but if you have not seen many patients this would be really tough for you. Okay, and the catch in this question was this only that they have mentioned redness of eye and many would go wrong here. The answer would be continue carbimazole. Again, it depends on your patient profile that what dose you need to continue, how much uh, already you have given the patient, what was his previous T4 level, all those things are really important. But just basic guideline I will tell you. So, these questions will be asked definitely in many exams. So, we have here clinical activity scoring CS that has 10 points in follow up and initially it has 7 points that is what the question mentioned 7 is score. So, if the score is 3 or more it is a clinically active like we diagnose patient graves then mild or moderate to severe graves orbitopathy inactive or active that is how we make a diagnosis right. So, if the CAS clinical activity score is more than equal to 3 will label as active graves orbitopathy and then only we will proceed accordingly. So, what are these clinical activity scoring all patients who come to you should be seen like that. So, there are two points for pain that is spontaneous pain and other is pain on movement. These are two points for pain, two points for redness, redness in eyelids or conjunctiva and three points for swelling, swelling in caruncle, eyelids or conjunctiva. And when the patient comes for follow up, there are three more points we add. So, total it becomes 10. So, we add that whether there is decrease in motility, decrease in visual acuity or increase in exophthalmos. So, that that points also we add to that visual acuity, exophthalmos and eye mobility. Okay. Now, coming to this is CVRT that that was clinical activity score. This is CVRT score. They have divided into three UGOGO guidelines. This I have taken from the latest one, uh, mild, moderate to severe and uh, very severe or sight threatening. So, moderate to severe, you just remember this, then you can uh, get other two also. So, if the lid retraction is more than two, or the patient has moderate to severe soft tissue involvement, exophthalmos more than 3 and inconstant or constant diplopia. Diplopia can be there even in mild, you will see here, intermittent or no diplopia. So, there is slight difference like patients sometimes have diplopia, sometimes does not have diplopia that is intermittent diplopia. Constant and inconstant is something different like 
patient seeing only on one side have diplopia that's inconstant diplopia that only during one thing he has constant that wherever he sees he has diplopia that's constant diplopia he is having constant diplopia right so these are three types and depending on the combination like the CVRT and the clinical activity score we'll decide that how to treat that patient so first see if the patient have mild graves orbitopathy obviously smoking is something you want to refrain you have to uh, ask your patient to quit smoking you have to make his thyroid function near normal so all those things we know and we don't want an hypothyroidism because see if you will cause that the tsh would increase this tsh will act on the receptor and will may lead to increase in this proptosis and all those things right so this is important now coming to mild management uh, mild graves orbitopathy management so if obviously eye care is there that artificial te uh, tears and gels that we know selenium we do give these patients at a higher dose and that is for mild graves orbitopathy for moderate to severe and if the patient have active or inactive that depends that what you want to give him if the patient have active graves orbitopathy then only patient will need steroid the previous guideline mentions only about uh, this methylprednisolone but now the newer guideline this year only they have released so this they have added this mycophenolate sodium along with this we give them uh, 0.5 milligram weekly dose for six weeks that is total three grams of methylprednisolone and followed by 0.25 uh, grams every week for next six weeks that is what is the regime for active moderate to severe graves orbitopathy the total dose should not exceed eight grams this have been asked many times in many exams okay and for severe there is another regime we give either alternate day or daily at a higher dose okay and in our question the patient have uh, the question we have this activity score of 2 by 7 that means these patient have inactive graves orbitopathy should not be given steroids okay next question here we have a patient suffering from type 1 dm on insulin glargine and lispro the patient is now experiencing repeated episodes of morning hypoglycemia what is the next step for this patient do you want to reduce the night dose of glargine you want to change it to nph you want to stop glargine or do you want to uh, change lispro or say decrease lispro whatever you want so these are options here if you know the basic thing that what are the types of insulin what is their duration of action this is very very easy question and don't confuse it with the dawn or somyogi phenomena there you have morning hyperglycemia the patient here has hypoglycemia right so we have morning hypoglycemia we know that glargine is a long acting this lispro is a short acting i have taken this chart from harrison latest edition we know that these are aspart glue lysine lispro regular insulin all are short acting nph is intermediate acting and this degludec detimer glargine are long acting this is how you know uh, that what to decrease when to decrease and when what insulin should be increased so the duration of glargine is approximately 20 hours the lispro which our patient was taking the duration is only two to four hours so say that these patient have morning hypoglycemia he's taking dinner at say 9 or 10 pm and before that he is injecting lispro so that if he is injecting even say by 10 pm then that insulin would act up to 2 pm nowhere that lispro is going to cause hypoglycemia in morning because that's not going to act till morning till morning only this glargine would be acting so if this patient is having morning hypoglycemia the thing you want to do is decrease night time glargine dose okay and here uh, i have taken a graph also so that it becomes easier for you to remember all those things those who are not dealing with all these patients it's very difficult to cram everything so we have lispro as part and glue lysine these are rapidly acting you see here 
this would have action of say 4 hours right then we have regular insulin which will have 4 to 6 hours of action intermediate acting we have nph which will have action of say around 12 hours long acting we have glargine and deglutec also so this will act for more than 24 hours or say 24 hours and detimir slightly lesser than 24 hours so these three are long acting right so accordingly what the question says you have to answer and also these questions are also asked many times dawn phenomena and somyogi phenomena the best way to remember is you just add a word with somyogi somyogi rebound phenomena or a uh, mnemonic is so much insulin that is somyogi that way you can easily get it what happens in somyogi rebound phenomena that you have given so much of insulin that the patient have a hypoglycemia at midnight or say 3 pm 4 am somewhere 3 am 4 am and there is rebound hyperglycemia in the morning whereas in dawn phenomena you have given him so much of less insulin that his sugars were not controlled and as usually the resistance increases the morning sugars are high so the treatment is totally different here first the question would say that you have a patient with morning hyperglycemia secondly if the question mentions that uh, that patient have hypoglycemia then you need to reduce the dose because this hyperglycemia in the morning was due to counter regulatory hormone increase right so this is two question and also this is very very practically important because sometimes you don't ask and see patients so fastly and you keep on increasing this nighttime glargine okay because you know that fasting we have to target so you keep on increasing without asking this nighttime hypoglycemia so that's really really important ask your patient about symptoms because many of your patient won't be checking this uh, blood sugars at 2 am 3 am but at least you can ask for symptoms whether they have hypoglycemia symptom perspiration all those things fatigability right so that is important because there you have to decrease the insulin not to increase nighttime insulin okay Coming to our next question, we have here 22 year old female presented with primary amenorrhea, no history of excessive hair growth. The patient's mother also had similar complaints in the past and have conceived with help. What is the next best step in the management of this case? Whether you want to go for testosterone, USG pelvis or start on OCP or you want a day 22 progesterone okay so this is very important clinical question this again depends on see when the patient comes to you you don't test like that okay you will get one test first then you will get second test you get some two three tests or a bunch of tests then only you come to a conclusion right but here obviously as they have given no excess hair growth we don't want to take testosterone that is what they are pointing but usually what happens whenever these type of patient comes you need all those tests also you need fs uh, fsh because you want to rule out this uh, primary ovarian failure turner syndrome so you need that you need a thyroid profile you need a prolactin level you need a usg so all those things you obviously need right and they have given a family history also that can be multiple things right so i would go for usg pelvis as per the algorithm given in harrison right they've given this algorithm they, if the patient have amenorrhea first they want to know regarding uterus and outflow tract that would be obviously by a usg then if this is normal then they uh, want a beta scg but obviously this is a primary amenorrhea unlikely to be pregnant but that definitely you need to rule out first before further investigation and that can be done just by a upt test that's very cheap right so we get this first you should rule out pregnancy in anybody who have amenorrhea because that's the most common cause right then you need testosterone to rule out ch you need 17 ohp also 
then fsh you need prolactin you need ovarian fail, uh, insufficiency uh, premature ovarian failure all those things can be diagnosed here hypothalamic amenorrhea you need uh, again this fsh then you have prolactin level is very important that you need the question uh, according to the question the best answer would be uhg pelvis but again it depends on the clinical context and what you are suspecting depending on the history of the patient coming to next question a patient on metformin and glibenclamide starts developing hypoglycemia which of the following investigation has to be done to find out the etiology of this condition whether you want creatinine hba1c cbc or urine albumin this is very easy answer the thing you want here is creatinine but again i would say even before getting creatinine what is the most important i would say even all four options are wrong here what is the first thing you want to know if you have a patient of hypoglycemia right first is ask about symptoms first confirm the whipple strand okay if you cannot confirm that it is the mandatory thing usually what we do but if you cannot confirm that the most important thing again for this patient would be history which is not given in this option you don't want any test you want first history say a patient has hypoglycemia he has not eaten right he has taken the medicine he has hypoglycemia why do you want to test right then say patient have wrongly taken two medicines or patient has uh, a fast any religious fast and taken the medicine he would develop hypoglycemia so all these things are really really important that what amount of medicine he has taken whether he has been started on some other medication also some ayurvedic treatment he has taken something something all those history is important rather than going for directly test and if these are thing then this you need creatinine because in ckd this will lead to hypoglycemia and obviously we don't give this sulfonylureas in ckd patient right or even if you want to prescribe you prescribe a short acting sulfonylurea usually we don't give them and glibenclamide is a long acting sulfonylurea obviously this will cause hypoglycemia in a deranged uh, create or decrease egfr patient okay coming to our next question a patient has undergone surgery for acromegaly but did not seek immediate relief what is the next step in the management okay so this is also important do you want to go for radiotherapy long acting octreotide repeat surgery or peg vesomen again how the question was formed the answer would totally change what we do in practice is like if a patient has not undergone um, like his gh level has not gone down which we check immediately then you can either go for radiotherapy you can go for somatostatin analogs or you can even go later on for a repeat surgery and you can obviously give that patient peg vesomen so obviously all the four options are right here but the question here asked was that he is seeking immediate relief okay so i would tick here octreotide as a right answer because see this radiotherapy can take up to 5 years and what we do in clinical practice is we give them radiotherapy and along with that we start these drugs till that radiotherapy is taking its effect these drug will take care of uh, having the symptomatic relief decreasing the igf1 so that is what we do in clinical practice now coming to the guideline this i have taken from endocrine guideline which was uh, published in 2014 so for management of acromegaly obviously surgery tss is what we consider if the patient goes in remission that's very good if the patient does not have remission his gh level is still raised you don't get igf1 immediately post operative because the half life is 
longer for IGF-1. So, usually we get around uh, 3 months, 12 weeks that is what we get the IGF-1 post-surgery for these acromegaly patients. So, for this persistent disease, you can either go for uh, somatostatin receptor ligands that is octreotide or dopamine agonist that is for mild disease usually we do not give all those cabergolin right or we can give pegmisomant. But in practice we usually give this uh, octreotide or long acting octreotide LAR ok. This pegmisomant practically is uh, very costly and difficult to get. So, usually we do not give that. Now, coming to what the Harrison says, that is what the guideline says. Harrison, they have written like, see, if you have adenoma, you have to go for surgery. If surgery cure is there, then obviously the same thing follow. If surgery is like unlikely to cure this patient, you can start with somatostatin analog and you can do a debulking surgery ok that is what they says and after surgery if this GH is still elevated they have clearly mentioned somatostatin analog as the first thing right and then later on again you have to monitor and then dopamine agonist and all those radiotherapy they have kept lower down so by going with the Harrison that is what your need SS was based. So, I would take somatostatin analog as the correct answer. So, for this question we have long acting octreotide the correct answer here ok. All the following are side effect of growth hormone except depression, benign intracranial hypertension, hyperglycemia or edema. So, this we have discussed many times the answer here is depression. In fact, it will help to elevate the mood, it will overall improve the quality of life in GHD. These are the side effects of growth hormone therapy. CJD, when initially we use pituitary derived growth hormone, pituitary derived growth hormone. So, this CJD was the side effect, but not with the DNA derived growth hormone which we use. Leukemia and CNS malignancy, I would like to stress here that this is very controversial thing initially, but now we know that they do not cause leukemia and CNS malignancy. Say uh, these patients like uh, those patients who are receiving these growth hormones, some syndromic cause, they are already prone for leukemias and all those things. So, later on when the data came out, it was shown that there was no increased excess with growth hormone in leukemia. CNS malignancy, again it was very controversial like say a patient have craniopharyngeum or another CNS tumor and you have operated. Now that patient has panhypopate. So, do you want to replace him with growth hormone or not and whether this can increase this uh, the primary tumor whatever you have operated can, can this cause recurrence or uh, can this lead to some another CNS malignancy. So, that is now well taken that it does not cause that we have now data for that. Pseudo tumor cerebri what the option was benign intracranial hypertension yes it is uh, a side effect of GH therapy and whenever patient come with say ataxia or some drowsiness vomiting you should check fundus. Slip capital femoral epiphysis, uh, it is also slightly controversial, but yes, it can, we do not have exact data for this. Scoliosis, we know it causes diabetes, yes, it causes initially. Now, again, there is data that even when you stop it, the diabetes may remit in some and especially when you are giving this growth hormone to Turner syndrome patient, these Turner syndrome patient are already prone for diabetes and when you give this further you are increasing the uh, incidence for that, that we should counsel those patients. Worsening of OSA is really important. I have kept this last just to discuss that especially in those like predator villi syndrome where you give this growth hormone, there can be worsening of OSA which should be checked, right. So, these all things are clinically relevant, may, they may not be asked in question, but yes important, ok. Coming to next question, diabetic retinopathy causes all the following except there was an image given, uh, exact image we could not get that. So, what are the thing not included in diabetic retinopathy? 
arterial narrowing soft exuded hard exuded or new vascularization the answer was very easy arterial narrowing this is for hypertensive retinopathy right there is uh, arterial narrowing due to constant increase in pressure this classification is important clinically as well and sometimes question can be asked though this would be a tough question than the previous one we have mild moderate and severe npdr and we have pdr that's proliferative diabetic retinopathy if you have neovascularization then obviously it's proliferative diabetic retinopathy first see what is severe non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy we have a rule of four to one what is four to one one we have prominent irma in one quadrant two quadrant or more we have venous bleeding and four that is in all the quadrants we have intraretinal hemorrhage more than 20. So, if this is there then we see that this patient have severe NPDR. If the patient have only microaneurysm we say mild NPR and between this we say that the patient have moderate NPDR. If the patient is not satisfying criteria of severe NPDR, then we say that patient have moderate NPDR. Okay. So, this is important classification of diabetic retinopathy. Okay. Coming to our next question, uh, we have here a patient presents with multiple pancreatic calculi and uncontrolled blood sugar. Which of the following is false regarding this con uh, condition? So, basically they are asking about pancreatic diabetes or secondary diabetes, sometimes type 3C also they label. So, low glucagon, high variability in sugar, increased risk of pancreatic cancer or higher macrovascular complication. So, maybe I would say this is one of the best question for the um, NEET. The answer here is high macrovascular complication that is not there with this pancreatic DM. Why? You have to understand basic things then you do not need to cram all those because these do not have that the classical what we say risk factors like these patients are not obese, they are not hypertensive they do not have that classical risk factor. So, overall these macrovascular complications are lower in this pancreatic DM. Low glucagon, yes, they have low glucagon with pancreatitis, this pancreas is damaged and they have low glucagon, high variability in sugar. Yes, definitely it is very, very difficult to manage all these patients. Why? Because they do not have that high insulin resistance. As soon as you give very low dose of insulin, they will have this and also because the glucagon is also not there. So, that is also making this all thing very like they go into hypo, they go into hyper that is very like difficult to manage. Increased risk of pancreatic cancer, yes, they have increased risk and especially when you see these patients, if any patient of pancreatic diabetes comes to you with weight loss, you must rule out pancreatic cancer. That is why this diagnosis is really important right and one more thing do not ever prescribe them DPP-4 inhibitors or GLP-1 analog that is a absolute contraindication you should never give this vildagliptin, cetagliptin because you do not ask this patient about history of steatoria, history of pancreatitis sometimes we see that patient referred to us are prescribed these drugs so that is an absolute no no please do not give them DPP-4 inhibitors that is contraindicated okay important thing here like this pancreatic diabetes can be either alcohol related, secondary pancreat uh, due to uh, pancreatitis or it can be FCPD, fibrocalcific pancreatic diabetes which was initially called as uh, malnourishment related, malnutrition related diabetes that is what tropical chronic pancreatitis is later on can cause in advanced stage FCPD. So, this was a very good review by Dr. V. Mohan and just see the basic difference. Here in alcoholic chronic pancreatitis almost everyone is male. Here 
again male preponderance but 70 is to 30 ratio here second and third decade here fourth and fifth decade later on socio poor economy i've told you like uh, these were also malnourishment related diabetes was also the other name so they are usually poor this affect all strata then here the diabetes is more aggressive here slower rate of progression diabetes is more common in these type of patient and very important the type of calculi you see more calculi large calculi large duct that is how you remember right so in 90 percent of these patient fcpd you will have this pancreatic calculi these are large these are dense and have large duct uh, location is in large duct whereas here you have small speckled and ill-defined calculi this is about uh, alcohol chronic pancreatitis here the diabetes is also slightly lower than the fcpd then fibrosis is marked here and pancreatic cancer is very high here so you can just see pancreatic cancer is seen in both but it is very high here higher than general population in alcohol chronic pancreatitis so this is very important clinically also very important the question was good question here easy question low glucagon yes we see here high variability in glucose i have explained to you and increased risk of pancreatic cancer yes seen but no macrovascular complication is not increased in these types of patient okay coming to next question here a patient was taking insulin injection and an abdomen photo was given uh, with the question and they have given option of uh, whether it is lipohypertrophy and you have to avoid insulin this is hypertrophy and you want to go for surgery or umbilical hernia or you have to give steroid for this uh, lesion okay exact photo obviously we don't have the answer is probably here lipohypertrophy that is what they want you to know and this is very important clinically because see we have so many patients they are not being educated about how to take insulin and how to inject and all those things so what they do they keep on injecting on the same side and that side there is lipohypertrophy and because of this hypertrophy again their sugars go very haywire because when you inject insulin on the same side this insulin may not be released as appropriately and there may be even delayed release so what will happen that that time when the patient need insulin that time insulin was not there so his sugars would go up then when later on he injects it some another side then insulin is released appropriately and from the previous slide where there is hypertrophy there also insulin is continuously releasing so patient may go into hypoglycemia so this is very important whenever you have these kind of patient who are on insulin you need to not only take a proper history you need to examine them properly you have to look for this hypertrophy otherwise this glycemia will never be managed you have to ask about what amount of carbohydrate they are taking where they are injecting insulin and even sometimes we see patient like patient injecting on uh, say thigh and going for cycling then that insulin is released more fastly right so the duration of action that the insulin has uh, like would be working is reduced and patient can land up into hypoglycemia so these are very important thing basic thing and you have to spend time with your patient then only you will understand all these things okay next question we have here pubic hair was present and genotype given was 46 xy along with amenorrhea so what is the disease Seer syndrome, Refstein syndrome, gonadal dysgenesis or CAI. Okay. So, complete androgen insensitivity. So, CIS, this is unlikely. Why? Because we have pubic hair present. So, if the hairs are present, this is not a correct answer. We have XY with amenorrhea that means the patient is female as a raised as a female so we have here x y dsd right restin is another name for pis partial androgen insensitivity syndrome here most of the patient will have ambiguity so that patient does not have ambiguity the patient has amenorrhea and is raised as a female okay 
सो दिस इज अगेन आउट नाउ वी हैव टू ऑप्शन लेफ्ट शियर सिंड्रोम एंड गोनेडल डिसजेनेसिस यूजली वेन दे से गोनेडल डिसजेनेसिस दे मीन पार्शियल गोनेडल डिसजेनेसिस एंड शियर सिंड्रोम इज नथिंग बट कंप्लीट गोनेडल डिसजेनेसिस सो द आंसर प्रिफर्ड हियर इज शियर सिंड्रोम हियर द पेशेंट हैज गोनेडल डिसजेनेसिस एंड दिस that is why this 44 uh, 46 xy is raised as a female and presenting as amenorrhea okay this gonadal dysgenesis can be a correct answer but a better answer is sewer syndrome and these two definitely we won't uh, have this b and d is completely wrong okay so the answer preferred is sewer syndrome coming to next question BMD testing indicated in which of the following condition whether you want it for a male patient who is asymptomatic and age more than 70 year pre menopausal female asymptomatic patient fracture occurring before the 50 years of age okay obviously most of you would have not take this as pre menopausal female and asymptomatic patient you don't want BMD for them the main confusion was between these whether you want to go for a patient who is asymptomatic and more than 70 years or you want to go for bmd in a patient who have fracture and is less than 50 years then again it depends on guideline what you are following and also the question does not mention that it was a fragility fracture that it was after trivial trauma okay that does not is not mentioned in this question otherwise that can also be a correct answer so the correct answer here is male because what guideline you are following accordingly the answer can change slightly so i compiled here this is uh, this was taken from up to date we have here nof guideline iscd guideline and aac guideline iscd international society for clinical densitometry that is the guideline we usually follow in our clinical practice but the question can be easily answered from this nof guideline they have taken directly options from this see here so they have uh, given here it, it may not be visible for you uh, to see these lines but i'll just read it for you so women more than 65 years and men more than 70 years regardless of the clinical risk factor you need bmd 65 and 70 is the cut off that was given in the option so that's a correct answer if you need for premenopausal women then it should be a uh, fracture uh, with trivial trauma that is what the guideline says in nof they have said that more than 65 more than 75 uh, 70 years in male postmenopausal above 50 less than this 65 if they have a risk factor and adults who have fracture after age of 50 years should be uh, subjected to bmd and any condition which will lead to low bmd like rheumatoid arthritis patient on glucocorticoid all those should be uh, subjected for bmd so this is what the nof guideline national osteoporotic foundation guideline says iscd also says something like that slightly different 65 70 same 50 uh, between 50 to 70 if risk factors are present along with any adult who have fragility risk fact uh, fragility fracture that should have uh, bmd done then other almost the same thing they have mentioned that if you have some risk factor which have this uh, like rheumatoid arthritis all those things ac again all women more than 65 years they don't have cut off for men here uh, and fracture which is not caused by severe trauma that patient should be subjected to bmd again that's the same thing after trivial trauma and post menopausal women with risk factor should be subjected to bmd so almost the same thing the answer here would be definitely male patient who is asymptomatic more than 70 years premenopausal asymptomatic patient and occurring before 50 years obviously they have not mentioned a trivial trauma fracture here coming to our next question a female patient with history of weight loss since the last 4 month presents with palpitation and goiter which of the following Uh, features given below favors the diagnosis of graves over subacute thyroiditis weight loss goiter or four months duration so 
this is very easy four months duration is something you won't find a hyperthyroid phase for a subacute thyroiditis for four months patient can have weight loss patient can have usually they have uh, slight goiter which is tender yeah so this i have taken from endo text you see here thyrotoxic phase usually lasts for four to six weeks for subacute thyroiditis then they have a hypothyroid phase then they have a recovery phase and similarly uh, if RIA is done in this initial phase, you may get a low uptake in recovery, you may get a high uptake and TSH is what the reverse of this uh, T4. So, 4 months duration is something which can differentiate if say a patient and one more thing important, eye signs. Obviously, it was not an option in this question but eye sign definitely it will differentiate between graves versus thyroiditis. So, if the patient has eye sign long duration of disease, you are dealing with graves. Okay. Next question, we have a patient on denosumab since past one year, which, uh, which of the following would you be, would be the next step to know the response to the drug? Do you want to repeat DEXA scan? You want to check bone markers or DEXA scan is not required with denosumab? The answer is you can go for a repeat DEXA scan. Yes, you can check the bone markers, but that is not what the guidelines suggest. That is not what we do in routine practice. What we do is this denosumab for osteoporosis, we give 60 milligram, six monthly, subcutaneously, and we check for changes in BMD. That is important. Coming to our next question. This in this uh, in a case of MTC, the calcitonin level are 100 picogram per ml. What should be the next step in management? PET to see uh, metastasis, total thyroidectomy uh, with bilateral neck exploration, or rule out pheochromocytoma. Okay. So, this actually exact wording of the question is needed for the correct answer. But usually calcitonin level correlate with metastasis and this PET scan is done post-operatively. In this question, we do not have whether the diagnosis is established or not, whether the patient has been operated or not. So, the answer could change. Let us say if you have a patient who have calcitonin more than 100 and it is not proven MTC, then the best answer would be you need a USG with FNAC to prove that it is MTC. So, that would be the answer. Let us say this patient is preoperatively and uh, you have diagnosed MTC and calcitonin is more than 100 picogram per ml. The best answer would be to rule out pheochromocytoma. So, it depends on exact wording of the question. The answer may change. And if you have ruled out then, then you need surgery, then you know, then depending on your calcitonin level, CEA level, all those things, further guidelines are there that how to proceed for this MTC. The best answer is rule out pheochromocytoma, which should be ruled out in every patient for men. Okay. Next question, we have a patient who came to the clinic with history of secondary amenorrhea. This female also have galactoria and visual difficulties and prolactin level was 29 nanogram per ml and on MRI 3 into 3 centimeter mass was seen and how do you want to proceed further? Do you want to go for surgery as prolactin is near normal? Do you want to repeat prolactin in 1 is 200 dilution or do you need to repeat prolactin with PEG? So, all the three options we will see here. Do surgery for say, obviously we need other information also, but say this prolactin was normal or is abnormal, is raised, that totally changes the treatment because for prolactinoma, whatever the size, medical management is indicated, not the surgery, right? It depends on later on surgery is also indicated in few case uh, patients, but definitely initially it is the medical management, whatever the size of prolactinoma is there. So, this prolactin is really, really important that what is the level 
and depending on the size of the lesion depending on the size of this prolactinoma there is some predictability with uh, the prolactin level so if you have a very uh, big lesion this is macro adenoma with a uh, like uh, 29 nanogram per ml prolactin it can be due to stock effect or it can be really co-secreting tumor all those things so we have to see in dilution because to rule out hook effect what is hook effect just see that this is very important see there is sandwich assay where one is a capture antibody which will attach with whatever analyte you want to check for here it is prolactin then there is an detection antibody which is labeled to something which we pick up the signal right so this is the basic thing the sandwich assay so see here in the second option which is showing the b part which is showing the hook effect here there is a capture antibody here and this prolactin is very very high and this is labeled antibody and this signal we pick up on the assay so what is happening that because this prolactin is very high this sandwich formation is not there something like prozone phenomena right so this prolactin is being attached to the solid phase also to the labeled uh, labeled antibody but when you wash out the sandwich is not formed so this will go away and you will find that the signal is less and you will have falsely negative result now come to macro prolactin the one option was there uh, to get with peg so here what happened there is macro prolactin what is macro prolactin it's nothing it's the big prolactin which is bound to some other protein usually immunoglobulin so what happens that this this is uh, already um, attached with immunoglobulin right this is biologically inactive but because this molecule is big this is not uh, excreted in the via kidney and it remains in the blood so the patient won't have symptoms don't have uh, features of hyperprolactinemia but when you will take uh, when you will get the assay when you will check the prolactin the prolactin is usually high this is the problem and many of the tests are done unnecessary you see now like in all those um, these also you get all the, all the tests are done together without any clinical features so that time sometimes you will pick up that the prolactin is high now what to do so this may be the condition it's common okay so here we have a solid phase again we have labeled antibody and this antibody is attached i would not say this is exactly a false positive result because yes there is prolactin and but it's not biologically active so the assay will detect that there is high prolactin which is there and now coming to prolactin level may help you to guide the diagnosis like in this case we have a very like near normal or slightly high prolactin with a very big mass so this depends on what is the prolactin level see micro prolactin usually have 100 to 250 nanogram per ml of prolactin whereas in macro prolactinoma which is our case the prolactin is usually high and we should c4 hook effect if prolactin is mildly raised then we have nfpa which may be our case here if the dilution prolactin is normal and then again drugs primary hypothyroid and macro prolactinemia also give a high prolactin level okay this is what is prolactin uh, different molecule the free prolactin which is the monomeric form which is actually the biologically active prolactin which is a 23 kilo dalton protein this has been asked many times and a big prolactin which is dimeric of the same which is inactive and big big prolactin this is what is macro prolactinemia okay so this is actually uh, checked by peg precipitation okay next question which of the following drug is safe to administer to a patient suffering from osteoporosis with a creatinine clearance of 20 less than 25 so egfr is less than 25 do you want to give that patient zolintronate alintronate or denosumab obviously these bisphosphonates are not indicated that are that is contraindicated below 30 or 35 egfr and denosumab is the one which can be given and dose we already know that 60 milligram subcutaneously six month apart we have to give that okay next question 65 sorry this is 65 year 
सिक्सटी फाइव ईयर मेल इज ग्रॉसली हाइपोथायरॉइड क्लिनिकली एडिमा ऑफ द फेस पफीनेस गोइटर टी एस एच इज सिक्सटी वॉट इज ट्रू डू यू वॉन्ट टू स्टार्ट विथ हंड्रेड माइक्रोग्राम बिकॉज इज फ्रेंक हाइपोथायरॉइड इफ ही मिस्ड वन डोजेज ही कैन टेक टू टैबलेट्स टूगेदर नेक्स्ट डे एंड यू नीड अ टी थ्री और से टी फोर बिफोर स्टार्टिंग द ट्रीटमेंट ओके दीज आर योर फोर ऑप्शन सो विल यू स्टार्ट अ पेशेंट हु इज सिक्सटी फाइव ईयर्स ग्रॉसली हाइपोथायरॉइड नो डेफिनेटली नॉट दिस शुड नॉट बी डन देर शुड बी ग्रेजुअल इंक्रीज इन द डोज दिस इज रॉन्ग ऑप्शन चेक टी थ्री many of you would have ticked this but this is again a wrong because see now you have a patient who has tsh and maybe this tsh most of sa would report more than 60 or more than 100 because of their like uh, range right because beyond that they don't detect maybe this is more than 60 so when you have such a clinical feature with tsh what are we going to derive from t3 and t4 we usually get this t3 t4 where we feel that yes we may miss secondary hypothyroid but this is not the case here even if you get t3 t4 nothing is going to change it should not be done because you have clinically this patient as hypothyroid with a raised tsh this is hypothyroid okay we need treatment for this if one dose is missed two tablets can be taken together next day yes obviously because the half life of this thyroxine what you are giving this t4 half life is 7 days right this has been asked many time half life is 7 days so this can be given if you miss one dose you can ask your patient to take two tablets next day okay next question which of the following is false statement regarding adrenal insufficiency hyperkalemia 80% adrenal androgen does not differentiate between primary versus secondary insufficiency adrenal insufficiency and secondary usually do not have salt craving okay they have asked false statement the correct answer is hyperkalemia whether they have asked question about just adrenal insufficiency or primary adrenal insufficiency that's addison's disease the percentage would change this dyselectrolemia is more in a primary case versus a secondary adrenal insufficiency primary insufficiency the data uh, in harrison for hyperkalemia is 40% whereas uh, in williams it is 66 to 68% in the table they have given different in the literature they have mentioned different somewhere around 60 66% for hyponatremia harrison says 80% decrease sodium this i am talking about primary adrenal insufficiency addisons and william says somewhere around 88 89% okay so these these are numbers important here adrenal androgen does not differentiate between primary versus secondary yes because this androgen are under control of acth right so when you have primary obviously you have destruction of that adrenal gland androgen would be less when you have secondary that means the pituitary is not giving that signal the acth is less then also this androgen will be low that means with androgen you cannot differentiate between primary versus secondary secondary usually do not have salt craving yes this is also correct why because see we have three axis there right the three layer gfr we know that glomerulosa fasciculata reticularis so this mineralocorticoid axis this is governed by renin right so this is not affected because it slightly it is released by acth also i know that but it is mainly the renin axis which releases the aldo and this is intact in secondary adrenal insufficiency that is why they have slightly less in secondary they have slightly less of this salt craving and uh, or they do not have salt craving and usually they have less dyselectrolemia the dyselectrolemia is not only because of this cortisol but when there is uh, this cortisol insufficiency like mineralocorticoid excess is okay we know that but in secondary when the cortisol is less the adh is 
more that is why the there is hyponatremia in those patients okay coming to our next question patient with uncontrolled diabetes along with motor and sensory neuropathic symptoms with no nephropathy or retinopathy uh, which of the following is true statement so presence of motor predominant points to alternative cause other than diabetic retino uh, diabetic neuropathy absence of nephropathy and retinopathy rule out other causes of neuropathy first and uh, biopsy tells diagnosis better than nerve conduction studies okay exact option we again we don't have for this question but motor predominant can be seen in a diabetes we know that there is uh, even reticulopathies cranial neuropathies most common is obviously distal sensory polyneuropathy dspn but we get all those like there is complete range in diabetic neuropathy so this option is uh, not correct here then option we have absence of nephropathy and retinopathy rule out other causes of neuropathy yes that's true in fact diabetic neuropathy is a diagnosis of exclusion you need to exclude other causes before labeling any patient as a patient of diabetic neuropathy that is how it is defined and if those patient does not have this um, retinopathy and nephropathy then it is more likely that this is not diabetic neuropathy but even if they have also for diagnosis it is recommended that you should rule out other causes of neuropathy biopsy tells uh, better diagnosis no it is ncv which is the gold standard that is how um, it is diagnosed okay next question a patient who is suffering from graves disease has history of smoking was on methimazole for two years now presents with low TSH T416 and clinical activity score of 2 by 7. What is your next step? Do you want to go for surgery? Do you want to continue? Uh, you want to go for radio ablation or do you want to continue methimazole? Again, this question is a clinical question. This would be a shared decision between your patient and the doctor and depending on the availability, depending on how uh, the there is local treatment, all those things slightly change in practice. But according to guideline we see here, like the patient has already taken methimazole for two years. First and foremost thing is first check for compliance whether this patient has actually taken the methimazole or not if he has taken the methimazole still he has low tsh we don't have here value but it's okay because for all this hyperthyroid what we are going to target is t4 so t4 is 16 microgram per dl so that's high the upper limit for most of the assays is 12 so here we want to go for radio iodine ablation now again it depends on the graves orbitopathy cvrt which is not here here activity is given but if even if the it is active you can give the steroid and go for ablation and 2 by 7 by the way is not active it's an inactive graves orbitopathy which the patient has already received methimazole for two years usually if the patient does not respond for 18 months they are not going to respond it depends on the size of the goiter it depends on the trab level depends on the age of the patient if the patient is young less than 40 years even if the patient is uh, responded there are higher chance of relapse so there are various gradings so clinically what i would prefer in this patient is a radio ablation and so, few of the candidates told that there was an option of stop smoking or quit smoking. So, that's obviously there. That's the correct answer that you want this patient to stop smoking. Next question. A patient comes to a clinic with complaints of abdominal pain. A CT was done which showed a 4 into 4 centimeter mass in the adrenal gland with minus 20 HU ounce field unit. Uh, what is your diagnosis adrenal myelolipoma acc adenoma okay so now as more and more tests are being done now we pick 
cup incident low mass incident low mass like imaging was done for something else like in this case it was done for abdominal pain that is what is like most common presentation a patient with uh, anything like even now for covid pneumonia sometimes the sections are being taken up to adrenal so we pick up many adrenal incident lomas these adrenal incident lomas according to guideline needs workup for hormonal analysis but the jcm guideline says that if you have this type of uh, incident loma where the hu is minus 20 it's adrenal myelolipoma and you may even skip the hormonal evaluation whereas aac other guidelines says that you need evaluation even in this case for uh, hormone excess basically whenever you find an incident loma you have to rule out two things first whether it's hormonally active or not and whether it's malignant or not that is what is the indication for surgery right so this is adrenal myelolipoma with minus 20 hu then again there is like what are the borders how to follow there is complete guideline that uh, how much centimeter it increases is how much duration so all those things are like next level question most commonly they'll ask you that whether you need to work on this or not whether the hormonal evaluation is needed or not and what all hormonal analysis or evaluation you do on this patients and yeah one more question was asked that incidence or like prevalence of uh, incident lomas so it depends on the age of the patient whatever your sample population as you uh, take a older population more and more incident lomas are pick up and also it depends on what modality a ct in pituitary would pick up less mri would pick, uh, pick up more and further biopsy uh, would uh, autopsy would uh, pick up further more incident lomas so somewhere around 10 percent is the rate for adrenal incident lomas okay coming to our next question which of the following drug interfere with dexamethasone suppression test carbimazole statin or amlodipine this we have discussed many time and this is very important for evaluation of cushing the answer is carbamazepine so how does this carbamazepine changes this uh, ondst LDDST, whatever dexamethasone suppression you are taking overnight or low dose high dose so this what will happen this carbamazepine what it will do that see what is the basic of all this suppression test you give that patient dexamethasone from outside that's a steroid right so what will happen that whatever internal there would be suppression the ACTH would decrease the cortisol will decrease and why we are giving dexamethasone because it does not cross react with your assay okay that is why now when the patient is taking this carbamazepine what will happen that whatever dexamethasone you are giving say for ondst overnight dexamethasone suppression test you have given one milligram of dexamethasone that is what is done but due to this carbamazepine that is metabolized very fastly so actually patient has not in that blood it has not been uh, achieving that level that is why suppression is not there so you will get a falsely positive that falsely unsuppressed ondst with this so accelerated dexamethasone metabolism with phenobarb uh, then phenytoin carbamazepine rifampicin and even pioglitazone so these are very important drugs before evaluation of cushings in all your patients please look for this then you have impaired dexamethasone metabolism that means you will get falsely negative test because ondst you need only one but if you increase the dose you can just like say that it has become more uh, robust now like more uh, like what do you do in hdadst you give a very high dose so your even 1 mg is now very high dose because the metabolism was inhibited by something else usually it's the itraconazole why because see these patients of cushing's usually have fungal infection tinea right and they are on these fluconazole itraconazole right so and even diltiazem because they are hypertensive so these drugs are kept uh, should be checked before prescribing all these ondst and all those types of tests then you have a drug which increases cbg a patient say a female already obese uh, have irregular menses on ocp so 
हर कॉर्टिसॉल लेवल मे नॉट बी सप्रेस बिकॉज दिस ओ सी पी हैज वॉट इट हैज डन इट हैज इंक्रीज द सी बी जी लेवल ओके दिस एस्ट्रोजन इन द ओ सी पी हैव इंक्रीज द सी बी जी लेवल सो यू वुड गेट अ फॉल्सली पॉजिटिव टेस्ट दैट मीन्स यू विल गेट योर पेशेंट दैट इट्स द टेस्ट इज अनसप्रेस ही हैज और शी हैज क्वेशिंग्स राइट then carbamazepine also increases 24 hour urinary free cortisol we have seen a patient who had seizure was on carbamazepine so both the tests are now out you cannot do ondst you cannot do 24 urinary cortisol say a patient on itraconazole you can do this 24 hour urinary cortisol this is not going to affect this is only affecting metabolism this but carbamazepine is affecting both the test okay this i have taken from jcm guideline which were published in 2008 okay next question we have female with history of alopecia consulted dermatologist and took medication some medication she has taken and now uh, she got the test with low tsh and high t4 level so what is your um the best answer here can it be a graves can it be thyroid resistance can it be biotin interference yes it can be a graves disease obviously but depends on clinical features but we don't have any clinical feature in this question this is what happens when you get unnecessary tested no clinical feature but you get the test the reports will go haywire then you will start treating that lab report that is really wrong so i would say you treat your patient not the reports that's really really important so the answer here is biotin interference now let's understand why one assay it is decreasing say like basic thing what we understand is like most of you like if there is interference if it is increasing it should increase the tsh should increase t4 should increase or it should decrease then t should tsh should decrease t4 decrease but in biotin interference why so that it decreases the tsh but increases the t4 because the assays are different for t4 we have competitive immuno assay and for tsh we have non competitive sandwich immuno assay just understand the basic this is really important to understand why these tests are going this way so for we have here a analyte t4 which we want to test okay this is what will be picked up we have stravidin coated micro particles and on which this biotin annihilated antibody will be attached okay so see here in this we have this micro particle on which this antibodies are attached then this antibody will pick up this analyte like here like here okay and there would be a competitive uh this competition would be provided by this labeled analyte okay so this analyte labeled analyte and analyte are actually similar thing but this is labeled okay so this will compete with this so these two will compete and the higher signal you get that means lower the analyte in blood right so just opposite lower the signal of this uh, labeled analyte analog higher the t4 you have in your blood now what happen when there is excess of biotin see this so what happened this particle is now coated with this biotin which the patient took from outside so what happened that that this when there was excess of biotin even this antibody was not attached this this antibody was not attached so what happened you have less of uh, this uh, labeled analyte signal so what uh, the test gave you that the t4 is more that is the basic you just see this video again you will understand okay so this is why you get a increased t4 with a biotin interference now let's see what happened with tsh tsh the story is totally different again we have uh, this micro particle we have analyte which is tsh which we want to measure then we have a biotinated antibody and we have a labeled antibody that time the 
and what analyte was labeled here the antibody is labeled it's a non competitive sandwich immunoassay now see what is happening basically this is the micro particle on which everything would attach first comes the this antibody which are biotinylated antibody so this will be attached here see here like that this is attached now on this what will be attaching is a analyte which is tsh and on that a labeled antibody would be attached so it would be a sandwich this tsh would be sandwiched between the two antibody a labeled antibody and the biotinylated antibody okay this is what is happening here now the higher tsh you have more and more tsh you have more and more sandwich would be formed so more and more label antibody would be attached and more and more signal you will pick up that means here the tsh would be high if the signals are high right there it was opposite there was competition between the two now what happened when there was excess of biotin what happened that this micro particle was actually coated with this excess biotin so that this biotinated antibody was not attached so overall signal was not formed so this labeled antibody was also not there that sandwich was less so the signal was less so what your assay interfered that this patient have low tsh that is what is happening with excess biotin now i hope you understood this that why there is low tsh with a high t4 with the same thing in biotin interference right because the type of assay is totally different one is proportional to signal one is reverse to the signal the higher signal you get the lower is the thing is there uh, in another it's the higher the signal the higher the thing okay coming to our next question what is the function of thyroid peroxidase release of hormone into the circulation coupling mit to dit coupled to iodo compounds to one so these were some of the recall option we could get but the basic thing you should understand how the thyroid hormone formation is there so you can get the answer correct this was like pretty right forward uh, question so here we have tpo see what it does first thing is organification that is it binds this uh, iodine to the tyrosine residue of thyroglobulin thereby forming mit or dit and then it also acts on coupling thereby forming a t3 or t4 if mit and dit are coupled t3 is formed if two dit are coupled then a t4 is formed release actually there is a process by endocytosis and lysosome all those things but exact mechanism is not known so the correct answer in the option here is couple mit to dit coupling and organification is something which is done by tpo next question we have asymptomatic pregnant woman at 12 weeks of gestation with a low tsh with t4 of 16 microgram per dl what is the next best step of management do you want to observe this patient you want to start with ptu or you want to start methimazole most of you would have ticked as start ptu which is absolutely wrong first we don't have a exact recall but it depends on patient whenever such type of patient come to you you need to examine everything you have to see everything first let's see what is given in question t416 many of you would consider it as high with a low tsh first we don't have a what is the low value secondly this t4 is actually not high right why just now i have told you that okay 12 is the cut off for most of our test but you see this patient is pregnant so increase in estrogen causes increase in tbg so the upper limit of the t4 normal normal t4 for pregnancy is 50% higher that means up to 18 microgram per dl is normal for pregnancy secondly say this patient has low tsh that can be due to multiple thing that can be due to twin pregnancy where uh, scg is slightly higher due to vomiting all those thing you need to rule out the patient is asymptomatic 
clearly they have written secondly the patient have goiter or not all those things the patient uh, have trap sometimes we do get trap also if we suspect graves but for this patient i would suggest that a low tsh which we don't have if say low tsh is 0.2 which is actually low by sa but it is normal for pregnancy t4 is high which is actually normal for pregnancy so the best answer i would say is observe don't start treatment we need to repeat we need to see over all the patient right next question lumbar x ray uh, lumbar spine x ray was shown in a male with back ache and something was clinically given but we don't know probably they are talking about as but yes um, uh, this increased vertebral intensity can be with both as and fluorosis so you need to see what the question exactly says and if uh, like we differentiate clear in routine practice by getting an uh, urine fluoride level and um, water fluoride level and uh, x-ray of the arm can forearm can also be done where intraosseous member membrane calcification can be seen with fluorosis okay so that is how we see it but probably they would have asked about as but we don't have recall uh, next question we have a female with resistant hypertension since 3 months with her brother also suffering from resistant hypertension presents with nausea vomiting since 4 days along with headache diminished vision and ct abdomen shows some adrenal mass urine metanephrine were elevated what is the next step do you want a genetic test before surgery you want an mri brain before surgery you want to do a plasma metanephrine fourth option we don't have here c plasma metanephrine when you have already got a urine metanephrine elevated with a clinical context you don't need plasma metanephrine that's absolutely wrong now this patient has pheochromocytoma right mri brain what is your diagnosis accordingly we could get an mri brain for say we screen in vhl for cerebral uh, and uh, spinal right so mri brain before surgery versus genetic testing the answer is genetic testing why this patient actually don't have uh, vhl but this patient has nausea vomiting with headache so diminished vision the patient may need an mri it actually depends on the exact question what was given but genetic testing is required for all pheochromocytoma and that's a correct answer but here considering acute condition you may need a ct not an mri if you are suspecting something you can get a ct here that is what we do clinically but again we need exact question and exact option what was asked about genetic testing this is really important what gene you want to screen you can get a whole panel that's okay but there should be like something you are suspecting this is the order which i'll get tested right so this depend on where is the lesion in our patient in the given question the patient has lesion at adrenal and the patient has increase in metanephrine not the nor metanephrine that was not given so the patient have adrenergic pheochromocytoma of adrenal right adrenergic that means adrenal only because other than adrenal you cannot get adren adrenergic pheochromocytoma okay so adrenergic adrenal pheochromocytoma first thing is to rule out men then tmm tmem and max gene this is the order suggested by the guideline in 2014 if in adrenal you have nor adrenergic then vhl is the first thing you want to rule out if you have extra adrenal then b sdhb is the gene you want to rule out first and if you have metastatic then again sdhb is the first thing you want to rule out but for skull base you need sdhd at least remember these points i know you cannot remember the whole chart this is really tough again just see if you have adrenergic that's like adrenaline secreting which will have metanephrine in excess that's men syndrome
If you have an adrenal tumor with a normetanephrine secretory tumor, it is VHEL most probably. If you have extra adrenal, so you want to first test for SDHD, uh, SDHB and skull base D is the thing you want to screen first. Okay. During the first trimester of pregnancy, what is the target TSH value required? 2.543. Okay. Not a actually very good question here because the recent guideline has removed this cutoffs. What they say that it depends on your population. You should get your own what is normal because it depends on the assay what you are using. The population is different. The assay is different. The iodine content of that region, the iodine deficiency is different. So, this TSH normalization, what is normal for pregnancy that should be uh, defined for each and every population and that to that population should be TPO negative, right? So, that is how the current guideline says. But if you follow a uh, older guideline, then answer would be 2.5 according to trimester. First trimester, second trimester and third trimester, they have given cutoff. Like in first trimester, the lower limit is 0 0.1. In second, it is 0 0.2. In third, it is 0 0.3. Upper limit for first trimester is 2.5. Second is 3. And for the third is again 3. So, these are the cutoff given for the trimester wise in older guideline. But the newer guideline has totally removed it. This is the thing. So, for our answer, we will go for 2.5 because it was mentioned first trimester target TSH is 0.1 to 2.5. Okay. Next question, we have a 65 year male with a known case of coronary artery disease with fatigue with weight gain and TSH level are 10. What is the next best step in management? Do you want to observe? You want to start with full replacement. Other two options we don't know. Start with full replacement is definitely wrong because an elderly with coronary artery disease, you don't want to start with full replacement. Say here the option was given, we start with 25 microgram or graded increase, whatever like this option was also in the question. Then what do you want? Okay, again, I would say you please take observe as the correct answer because what the guideline says. Firstly, we do not have a T3, T4 here. Let us say it is normal. It is a case of subclinical hypothyroidism because we will need that here, right? And TSH is 10. So, you need at least two values, at least four, three to four weeks apart, three to four weeks apart for diagnosis of subclinical hypothyroidism first thing is that so it's totally a single value secondly in coronary artery disease if the patient have angina which is not given in question but if he has this the uh, patient should not be replaced with the thyroxine again the cutoff Actually, age cutoff is also different according to the different guideline. If you will follow the European guideline or the ADA guideline, the cutoffs are different and experts all like when we do practically, it is totally different. It depends on patient to patient. If the patient have angina, you do not give them this replacement, right? So, this should be again verified with a second test. We need T3, T4. So, the best answer here is observe. Serotonin is deactivated with which of the following? This is easy. MAO is the answer and this give us 5-HIAA. Hydroxyindole acetic acid. Okay. Next question. A female present to the OPD with history of amenorrhea and a progesterone challenge test was done and the patient did not bleed. That is negative progesterone challenge test. What is the next ideal step for management? Do you want a UHG pelvis or a MRI brain? Obviously, not an MRI brain. The answer is UHG pelvis. We do not have other option. But even before giving this progesterone challenge stage, what is must? A must is a to rule out pregnancy test. So, a UPT or blood beta SCG test is something which is most important and should be done before giving this patient a progesterone challenge test. 
and the patient if has negative may have some defect because whether the patient have a primary amenorrhea secondary amenorrhea what are the clinical feature what is the thyroid status prolactin all those fsh maybe a poi all those things it's totally different it depends on whatever clinical context we are talking about this is an mcq the correct answer here would be a uhg pelvis not an mri brain and clinically the most important thing is upt that you do in all your patient with amenorrhea okay core phase is uh, delayed milestone no corneal clouding and uh, clinical features which of the following syndrome hurler hunter so sometimes uh, those old tricks of mbbs do help you to answer all these question what how i remember is like for hunting you need a clear vision so no clouding should should be there the answer here is hunter syndrome and all those mucopolysaccharidosis just most of the time this is a question they ask uh, delayed milestone course faces with uh, corneal clouding you tick hurler without corneal clouding you tick hunter that is most of the time that is only asked coming to our next question a patient presents with weight gain abdominal stri facial plethora easy bruisability the cortisol level were normal and low and high dose dexamethasone suppression test is raised or unsuppressed so what is next step in investigation dota pet ct or say mri pituitary so what do you want to do the answer is not this not this not this you need acth first again i would stress biochemical diagnosis is to be made before imaging in endocrinology that is a must an algorithm is to be followed otherwise you would go very very wrong say this you get mri and you find an incident loma and you will get operated on that patient and that patient will not go in remission in cushings so that is really important first we need to have a acth right so algorithm is a must this algorithm i have taken from harrison latest edition but better i would tell you what we do in clinical practice that is really important so you want your patient to be diagnosed as soon as with least uh, amount is spent and with least number of days stay in hospital so what we do like say in opd you have seen the patient in the morning you admit the patient and right at that night you start evaluation so at that night 11 pm you will get a 11 pm cortisol along with that you will get an acth along with that you will get a midnight salivary cortisol and also you can start 24 hour urinary free cortisol collection at this point only right then next day in 8 am cortisol you can get along with acth right so what will it rule out see first you will get a 11 pm cortisol that's also a screening test for cushings midnight salivary cortisol you will get that will help you that's another test acth here only you can say whether it's an uh, acth dependent cushing or not whenever you will establish your diagnosis yes it's a cushing here only you can say first thing to be uh, impaired is the diurnal variation in cushing so by getting 11 pm cortisol 8 am cortisol you will get that diurnal variation that whether it is disturbed or not more one more important clinically relevant point is that for this collection all this 11 point 11 pm collections you must get a vein flow beforehand because even that stress of pricking can raise your this 11 pm cortisol and acth so that's important then after this 8 am cortisol and uh, acth again at 11 pm you will have a midnight salivary cortisol you get uh, this collection right and this 24 hour urinary free uh, cortisol collection will also be over because now it's 24 hours and here only you give that patient 1 mg of dexamethasone and next day again you get a 8 am cortisol that will be a ondst 
ओवर नाइट डेक्सामिथासोन सपरेशन टेस्ट इफ इट इज मोर देन फिफ्टी नैनोमोल और वन पॉइंट एट माइक्रोग्राम पर डी एल दैट मीन्स दिस पेशेंट हैव अ हाई प्रोबेबिलिटी नाउ यू हैव थ्री टेस्ट ऑलरेडी इलेवन पी एम कॉर्टिसॉल मिड नाइट सेलाइवरी कॉर्टिसॉल टू सैम्पल्स यू हैव एट दिस ओ एन डी एस टी एंड यू हैव अ ट्वेंटी फोर आवर यूनरी फ्री कॉर्टिसॉल सो ऑल दिस टेस्ट यू हैव एंड अगेन दिस एट एम इफ यू हैव दिस देन यू कैन नेक्स्ट डे यू कैन प्रोसीड फॉर एल डी डी एस टी राइट दैट इज पॉइंट फाइव एवरी टू एट एट टू एट लाइक दिस वी गिव फॉर टू डेज एंड अगेन वी गेट द कॉर्टिसॉल सो इफ दिस इज अगेन पॉजिटिव देन डिपेंडिंग ऑन यूर ए सी टी एच लेवल विच यू ऑलरेडी हैव इफ इट इज मोर देन ट्वेंटी पीकोमोल सॉरी फाइव पीकोमोल और ट्वेंटी पीकोग्राम देन इट इज ए सी टी एच डिपेंडेंट कुशिंग्स एंड देन यू विल गेट एन एम आर आई पिट्यूटरी प्रोटोकॉल इफ यू गेट अ लीजन मोर देन सिक्स एम एम देन यू कैन प्रोसीड फॉर सर्जरी प्रॉब्ली दिस इज द कॉज ऑफ द कुशिंग्स इन दिस पेशेंट इफ यू गेट लेस देन सिक्स एम एम लीजन और से यू डोंट गेट अ लीजन एट ऑल एंड एम आर आई पिट्यूटरी इज एब्सल्यूटली नॉर्मल देन वी नीड आई पी एस एस this ipss is uh, will tell you whether this acth is being secreted from pituitary or not and this ipss cut off are also asked in previous exam that an unstimulated more than 2 periphery to central ratio and an stimulated with crh sometime vasopressin more than 3 is the cut off and lateralization index has been also asked it is 1.4 left is to right whatever is high that means from that the uh, this acth is being secreted so all these ratio have been asked previous exams and say if the cortisol is less than 5 picogram then it is acth independent and you want imaging for the adrenal so this is the overall protocol the main problem is here in this question is that uh, this cortisol level is normal doesn't say anything it just rule out that you don't have this exogenous cushing that is this we get 8 am cortisol here itself and 11 pm also if the patient have this exogenous cushing that means he has this cushing feature due to some steroid abuse then this 8 am cortisol would be low so that we need to rule out beforehand and you need an acth before proceeding to any imaging right the answer would be acth i don't know whether it was in option or not your uh, harrison also says the same thing here the cut off they mentioned is 15 in uh, clinical practice we usually take a cut off of 20 picogram per ml or 5 nanomole the conversion factor for nanomole to picogram is 4.5 uh, for acth and 27 for cortisol okay so this acth if less than 5 is independent you get ct adrenal and depending further uh, work up is done if you get an acth dependent you get an mri and all those things i have already explained how we do it in practice okay coming to next question a patient with low calcium high phosphorus high pth normal vitamin d so what would be this case first high pth with a normal vitamin d the common causes of uh, high pth is secondary right vitamin d deficiency will cause an increase in pth actually normalization of vitamin d is defined by that level only from where the pth raises right so that is how it was defined normal and uh, low calcium and high phosphorus it can be a pseudo hypopara that is with low calcium high phosphorus high pth that the pth you are giving uh, the pth which is being secreted is not uh, acting right or it can be a ckd as the option given here because of low calcium and high phosphorus the pth is high with a normal vitamin d so answer here is ckd next question we have a child presented to the opd with dkd uh, dk and insulin was given fluids were started the patient later developed cardiac arrest so what is the cause of this cardiac arrest whether hypokalemia excess fluid what is the cause so usually the cause is hypokalemia 3.3 is the cut off where you must stop insulin 
डोंट गिव इंसुलिन वॉट एवर द शुगर्स आर देयर इफ पोटेशियम इज लेस देन थ्री पॉइंट थ्री दैट्स द कट ऑफ गिवन फॉर इन द गाइडलाइंस ओके अदर देन दैट समटाइम दिस पेशेंट ऑल्सो डेवलप ए के आई ड्यू टू इन्फेक्शन इन डी के सो दिस पेशेंट कैन हैव कार्डियक अरेस्ट ड्यू टू हाइपर कैलीमिया एज वेल ओके I don't know the, whether that was given in the option or not. Another reason is hypophosphatemia. Okay, so hypophosphatemia is another cause for cardiac arrest. One more reason for cardiac death. Uh, one more reason for death is cerebral edema. And brain herniation. So. using too much of fluid can and uh, rapidly decreasing these uh, sugars can cause this cerebral edema and patient can have brain herniation and this patient can have death but at your level the answer most commonly would be hypokalemia next question uh, patient during postpartum period uh, shows failure to lactate this condition is seen due to which of the following shehan versus hypophysitis so this is really really interesting question and lot of controversy again it depend on what is the exact question somewhere what i got the feedback that they have mentioned di and also they mentioned a pituitary with thickened stock okay so if these two were there in the question the answer is for sure hypophysitis okay di is very rare in shehan and thickened stock is very classical of this the pituitary is enlarged with a thickened stock is hypophysitis that is how we diagnose right both can have this lactation failure both can have hypopituitarism everything is almost same there in shehan the question would say about pph or history of blood transfusion that is the thing you have to look in the question not the failure to lactate that can be in both the things okay so hypophysitis versus shehan the pointers would be pph di thickened stock now whatever the question is there accordingly we would answer there are subtle differences between shehan syndrome and uh, lymphocytic hypophysitis i have taken this from nature uh, primer in 2016 this was published so shehan we know that this is due to the poor obstetric care due to pph so this is more common in developing country where this is common in developed and developing country more because case wise more we see in shehan here right this would be only in women with uh, postpartum hemorrhage this would be in men women and children autoimmune disorder this is hypophysitis and autoimmune condition this is not such this follows pregnancy this can occur without pregnancy as well pph here we have seen the common deficiency is lactotroph here here it is corticotroph and thyrotroph okay again uh, di is very rare here and di is common here hyperprolactinemia can be seen in hypophysitis usually not in shehan the mri may be normal or it may show empty cella partial empty cella here it can be normal empty cella or contrast enhancement with a pituitary mass pituitary mass is not seen here in fact this is how we rule out like this is how we uh, see in shehan if there is mass then it cannot be shehan you have to rule out all those uh, nfpa non functioning pituitary adenoma and other causes to diagnose as shehan okay so i hope this is clear if the patient mentions thickened stock with a di the answer here is hypophysitis okay next question we have a 14 year old patient uh, with short stature with delayed puberty with standard deviation of minus 2.5 what is the next best step do you want to go for mri or do you want to observe for gold velocity okay so again this is very incomplete question what we got the correct answer would change depending on exact wording the diagnosis can be varied from anything like 
growth hormone deficiency to just CDGP. But probably they are asking about CDGP. The answer should be observe growth velocity and to rule out all those nutritional things, to rule out CKD and CLD, all those. So, those history are really important. Those examinations are really important. Then if this patient was female, then we need a karyotype also for the turner. We first need an MPHD also. This standard deviation is defined by normal population or an MPH that is also is to be seen. So, this question is completely incomplete. So, see the probable answer I would tick here is observe growth velocity considering that this is a CGDP. Also, we need a bone age for this patient. You cannot ask many things in a MCQ, whatever uh, the pointers they have given, we have to answer accordingly. So, the answer, best answer I think fits here is observe growth velocity. Next question, we have a child is brought for uh, screening for type 1 DM. There is history of uh, type 1 DM in the sibling. Which of the following indicates highest probability to acquire type 1 DM? Probably the third option would be a family history. Okay. So, the correct answer here is autoantibody for type 1 DM. This is very, very important because now more tests are done. We, you will get patient who have anti-TPO positive or anti-GET positive and they want to know about the risk or whether they have developed diabetes or not. So, that is also a very big confusion. Even between doctors, but see diabetes is clear cut defined by blood sugar level. Okay. That is fasting, PP, all those cut off HB1C we have. Having an antibody increases the risk. That does not qualify that you should label that patient as or that candidate as type 1 diabetes. Okay. So, this is from Richard Holt textbook of diabetes. Four antibodies we have GAD, anti, uh, GAD 65, anti GAD. 65 IA2 insulin antibody Z and T8. So, what is the highest predictivity that also depends on age, but overall highest predictivity in children is for anti-insulin antibody. This chart you may not be able to see, uh, but this is uh, from Richard Holt. You can just search for it and specific beta cell specific antibody are Z and T8 and insulin antibody most common antibody is GAT 65 okay so these are few important question few more I will tell you which are asked previously if the patient has three antibody then that patient will develop all those will develop 80 to 90 percent of those will develop type 1 DM in next 10 years and almost everyone in 20 years Okay, so yes, these antibodies have a very high predictability and as the number of antibodies increase, the predictability increases like more and more chances that the, this candidate will have diabetes, type 1 diabetes. Okay, GAD65 is an antibody which is most common in this type 1 DM. Okay, this is seen in 70 to 80 percent of your type 1 DM. Then IA2 is around 60 to 70 percent and ZNT8 is somewhere around 60 to 80 percent. This IA2 decreases with the age, but this GAT65 increases with the age. So, predictability decreases like like this also the prevalence of this GAD antibody increases with the age. As the patient ages, the prevalence of this positivity of anti-GAD is increased. Okay. And even in general population, 1% of general population will have this GAD 65 antibody positive and relative of type 1 DM have 8% this GAD antibody positive. So, all these prevalence have been asked in previous exam 1% and what is the which is the most common antibody in type 1 DM how uh, many years the patient can develop diabetes and these are very clinically relevant points because a patient coming to you 
with the type 1 dm sibling will may get his other baby the test and will ask you that what is the risk of my baby getting a type 1 dm right and it also depends on uh, the family history that is what we ask so if mother is type 1 diabetic there is chances of 2% that the baby will have diabetes father slightly higher 4 to 6 percent 4 to 5 is somewhere documented right in uh, williams it is 4.6 percent if both the parents are even higher then it would be 10 percent in monozygotic it is 50 percent uh, important fact here is like father type 1 dm would have a higher chance of a baby having type 1 dm versus a mother but it is reversed for type 2 diabetes like a mother uh, type 2 dm would have a higher risk of that baby having type 2 diabetes okay if both the parents are diabetic then 10 percent chances of having a baby uh, of type 1 dm whereas for type 2 dm it is almost 40 percent the baby, 40% uh, of the babies with uh, parents having uh, diabetes will have uh, type 2 DM. Okay, and monozygotic twins, it is 50% for type 1 DM risk and for type 2 DM, it, the risk increases to 70 to 90%. Okay, the though type 2 DM is polygenic, right, monozygotic twins have very high risk of having type 2 DM secondary hyperparathyroidism so this is like uh, i don't know what was the exact question but secondary hyperpara is when you have low calcium or low vitamin d and you have high pth right so it's vitamin d deficiency probably that was the question straightforward most common cause of type 4 artery a is diabetic nephropathy dkd Hyperanemic hypoaldo is type 4 RTA diabetes is the most common cause. Okay, next question. Uh, the question mentioned a female patient presented with feature of hypothyroidism and hyperpigmentation, developed nausea, vomiting, and hypotension soon after starting thyroxine therapy. So, what is the reason? Uh, it's pretty simple. It is the adrenal deficiency. Also, we have a clue here that the patient had hyperpigmentation. That means primary adrenal insufficiency, the ACTH was high and this is probably APS patient, right? So, here when you gave this thyroxine, there was increased hepatic metabolism of the cortisol and the patient landed in crisis. That is what happened and especially on those patients who are sub clinical hypothyroid this adrenal insufficiency per se also causes this tsh to rise slightly so please be vigilant that don't start all those patients directly on thyroxine you have to see patient clinically right a patient having postural symptom a patient having dyselectrolemia all those things should be kept in mind patient having hyperpigmentation lethargy weight loss all those things decrease appetite yes so adrenal insufficiency or adrenal crisis can be precipitated if you replace thyroxine directly without replacing the steroids. Next question, uh, the question mentioned a male patient with salt wasting uh, on day 7 of life. The next best investigation is obviously 17 OHP, 17 hydroxyprogesterone. The patient has CH. You can go through the marrow videos. So, you will and because this is a big topic to discuss here what all types are there what is the clinical presentation what are the assays when do you stimulate what are the cutoffs so all these things and some more tough cases like uh, what do you do for uh, fertility or what do you do in pregnancy if those patients become pregnant so all those things you should know at least the basics next question a patient had undergone surgery for hyper uh, thyroidism and he also uh, developed titney what would be the probable reason for this condition okay we got actually two recalls here either it was mentioned hyper thyroidism or it was mentioned hyperparathyroidism exactly we 
don't know but yes in hyperthyroidism if the patient has gone undergone a surgery it can be because all the four parathyroids are removed and the patient have uh, secondary or iatrogenic or post operative uh, hypoparathyroidism that can be one answer secondly when these patients are uh, because hyperthyroidism is a state of uh, increased uh, bone turnover all those things and uh, there is shift of calcium from bone to blood then these patient can sometimes have this high uh, titney hypocalcemia when this hyperthyroidism is corrected but it is very very rare now coming to the second thing hyper parathyroidism say that uh, question mentioned that the patient had hyper parathyroidism and that was operated then again you have two options here either that can be due to again post operative hypoparathyroidism that you have now removed this pth gland even one the other won't be so much stimulated and it will take time and this would be a transient hypoparathyroidism or if you have removed all or if by chance they are damaged then patient can have permanent hypoparathyroidism other thing is hungry bone syndrome so many question have been asked about this uh, post operative hypoparathyroidism versus hungry bone syndrome so this is important to discuss here we actually don't need pth level to discriminate these two right see what is the basic in first case what happened you have removed this pth gland now the pth is not synthesized right so calcium would be low phosphate would be high alp would be low right hungry bone syndrome what happened that due to persistent disease and especially very high uh, bone turnover because of very uh, high pth level this calcium was taken up fr from the bone to blood right now that signal is removed so what now bone formation would be very rapid so all those calcium is now picked up and patient can develop hypocalcemia that is what is hungry bone syndrome so here you would have a low calcium low phosphate and a high alp because bone formation is increased right so you can discriminate just by seeing phosphate if the phosphate is low that means this patient has hungry bone syndrome if the phosphate is high that means it is post operative hypoparathyroidism right again alp also can discriminate this calcium cannot discriminate this again pth is also helpful but when you can discriminate just by phosphate level that is what we do clinically then a question is there can it coexist like a patient have both the thing together usually not because this hungry bone syndrome for bone formation at least some pth is necessary right for hypopara hypocalcemia pth is not there and here pth is there right so these are two different thing again magnesium and all those thing also we see but this is the basic that phosphate can discriminate between these two coming to our next question a uh, 6 year old child with a weight of 32 kgs and height of 100 centimeter with testicular volume of 6 ml with a small penis so what is your diagnosis okay first you must know approximately that whether this patient this uh, boy is obese or not and whether it is short stature or not so for that approximation you must know because the graph won't be given to you for at 100 centimeter usually we have at four years that we know so for a six year boy having a height of 100 centimeter is definitely short right you see here the patient lies on minus three standard deviation and weight is above 97 percentile that means it's obviously short with obese right and if the boy is obese usually the height is also more and these patient may have uh, slightly early puberty so all those things we know but if you have any baby with obesity and 
a short stretcher then definitely you must see for endocrine causes okay cushing's disease no that's not the right answer here see first let's see one by one what can be how to approach this patient so we have short stretcher and obesity right either it can be cushing's it can be hypothyroidism it can be isolated ghd it can be pseudo hypoparathyroidism or it can be prader villi theek so all these options are we have here with obesity and short stature but the question does not mention any syndromic thing for here prader villi they would uh, tell you something like mental retardation or history of hypotonia so all those things are not there unlikely they want us to take this pseudo hypopera again h o phenotype is not mentioned no syndromic thing now we are left with cushing's hypothyroid isolated ghd best answer what i would tell you is hypothyroidism why because this patient have 6 ml of testes which is above cut off of puberty and this patient is just 6 year because this tsh can cause this testes to increase in volume probably we are dealing with this right the only pointer which i could see in this question because this is not the exact recall is volume of testes is 6 ml that is not expected for a cushings why uh, do we why did boy will have a higher testicular volume right so answer probably is hypothyroidism the that was a single line uh, question reno self gliptin we know that's lena gliptin we don't need to modify the doses of this dpp4 inhibitor next question we have in a patient with short stature and carrying angle probably wide carrying angle was given what is the false statement they have asked start gh estrogen simultaneously start gh first later estrogen and karyotype needed so probably by options and question they are talking about turner syndrome so in turner syndrome it depends on age of patient but usually we don't start these together simultaneously we start say a patient presented with short stature at 7 years 6 years or say even 9 years you want to give growth hormone first later on at 12 to 13 year when there is usually the pubertal age the onset of puberty you want that time you will have puberty induction protocol that we know that 0.25 that we have to give all those things we know and usually growth hormone is started at a higher dose in this patient what the guideline says is 13 35 microgram per kg per day is the starting dose for these patients so the question here asked is false statement so this is right start growth hormone karyotype is obviously needed this is answer here that start growth hormone and estrogen simultaneously unlikely but obviously it depends on the age of the patient right so we'll go for this but maybe the fourth option is even more wrong we don't know that this question we could not get the exact question what was asked with regards to thyroid hormone feedback mechanism something was asked but exact option and exact question was not found so a correct answer cannot be discussed here but yes you know about the feedback that's a negative feedback loop that everything you know probably this was an easy question now uh, next question we have which of the following is due to increase cmp again the exact question we don't have it was whether is due to increase cmp or which causes increase in cmp probably the question was uh, what uh, which hormone acts via this uh, pathway so in harrison it's uh, clearly mentioned see there are two types either it's a membrane receptor family or a 
न्यूक्लियर रिसेप्टर न्यूक्लियर रिसेप्टर वी नो दैट इट्स स्टेरॉयड ऑल दोज एस्ट्रोजन टेस्टोस्ट्रॉन कॉटिसॉल ऑल दोज देन वाइटामिन डी ओके सो दैट्स अ कंप्लीटली डिफरेंट टाइप ऑफ रिसेप्टर एंड डिफरेंट टाइप्स ऑफ हॉर्मोन्स हियर वी हैव मेम्ब्रेन रिसेप्टर बेसिकली दे हैव डिवाइडेड इनटू फोर एटलीस्ट थ्री यू मस्ट नो जी जी पी सी आर दैट्स जी प्रोटीन कपल्ड रिसेप्टर देन टायरोसिन काइनेस रिसेप्टर्स एंड साइटोकाइन इन साइटोकाइन वी हैव ग्रोथ हॉर्मोन एंड प्रोलैक्टिन विच वर्क बाय जेक्सटेड पाथवे देन टायरोसिन काइनेस वी नो इंसुलिन एंड आई जी एफ वन and we have g protein coupled receptors so g protein either stimulatory or inhibitory these are very important gs alpha gi alpha so the question was about this stimulation of cyclic amp the answer is tsh the probably this is this was the option there again you have to memorize this and once you um, go on detail mechanism of all these hormone you will eventually come to know all these things this will be automatically imbibed in your brain okay so this gs alpha stimulation of cyclic amp the answer here was tsh okay and inhibitory the somatostatin was there in a option but it does not increase it decreases cyclic amp probably that was the other option right one option was uh, gnrh and one option was ghrh so this ghrh acts by calcium dependent and this is phospholipase 3 dag ip3 pathway so that's different okay so this please try to remember this chart one question will definitely come in most of the exams okay coming to our last question here so in this uh, something clinical clue was given along with this uh, vbg or A abg uh, ph was 7.23 bicarb was 17 sodium 141 potassium 2.9 chloride 108 and urine ph was 6.8 the option was jogren can cause it ammonium chloride test needed for the diagnosis and something was like metabolic acidosis with hypokalemia so obviously it's a metabolic acidosis we have here ph less with the less of carbo uh, bicarbonate 24 is the cut, uh, level which we take so it is less so it's definitely metabolic acidosis yes there is hypokalemia so this is obviously a correct here answer jogren can cause it yes it's a distal rta and yes it can be by this ammonium chloride test is needed for the diagnosis this now depends on what was the fourth option so they have asked which is the wrong option here you may need ammonium chloride test for distal rta that everybody of you know but whether this is needed in this test uh, this patient or not this is not needed in this patient because this patient already have acidosis and with that the urine ph is not acidified that means you have this as a distal rta diagnosis you don't need to further acidify right but the patient already has a bicarbonate of uh, 17 right 18 is the usual cut off we take so this uh, patient has already acidosis and still the urine ph is not acidified so this patient had distal rta but if the fourth option was further wrong then yes ammonium chloride test is needed for diagnosis of distal rta that's a correct thing but ammonium chloride is not needed for diagnosis of distal rta in this patient so we need the fourth option to be very sure that what is the answer for this question so this comes to end of the discussion in neat ss recall all your comments are welcome and some of the question we could not get you can comment uh, you can write on the comment box and any doubt is further welcome we'll try to clarify as soon as possible thank you